We thank you for the support of public and private grants which have generously funded this venture. We thank you for the very generous private donors whose financial gifts are helping turn our vision into a wonderful new reality. We are so grateful, Lord, for them all, and we ask your blessing upon them. Bless also, we pray, the laborers who will do construction work here. And bless our staff who are taking on new responsibilities as the project moves forward. And be with our clients whom we will continue to serve during the days of transition ahead. As we break ground, we ask your help and guidance so that what we are doing here today may well serve the needs of people without homes for many, many years to come. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. I've been asked to reminisce a bit. One of the things about growing older is that you're still here and you can reminisce from many years ago. And I was actually in on the ground floor of homeless services in Quincy when it started back in, I believe it was 1983. One of the things you find with memory, however, is that it's a little selective. You remember some things and you don't remember others. And so this is not going to be an exhaustive list of important or significant people. It's just going to be a sampling of events and people who have help made Father Bill's and Mainspring what it is today. Way back then, and I believe it was 1983, a new thing was happening. Uh, the large institutional, mental institutions had closed and people with mental problems and difficulties were finding their ways to the streets and people who were labeled then as homeless were showing up on church properties. In Quincy, it started out at Sacred Heart. Uh, the chapel there was open all the time, and homeless people would come into the chapel and stay overnight in the pews. And then in the morning when the faithful came for daily mass, they were sometimes frightened by homeless people who would suddenly out of, appear out of nowhere and take their leave. In other churches, at St. Chrysostom's in Wollaston, Quincy, United Methodist, people were staying overnight in the bushes. In our church at Wollaston Lutheran, they were staying in the window wells. Uh, down at the Leiden Funeral Home, they were staying in the enclosed porch. But this obviously was a situation that needed remedy. And so the religious community was invited to a meeting that was summoned by Father Neil Heary at Sacred Heart to discuss the situation and to come up with some kind of solution to what was happening. And from this meeting, the Quincy Interfaith Sheltering Coalition was born. Very early, and in fact, I believe it was the earliest facility that offered their space to help house homeless people was the Salvation Army. And at that time, it started as a uh, volunteer operation where volunteers would come in and stay overnight at the facility with about a half dozen homeless people at the time. Well, this didn't answer the need, and so a new site was needed that could house a few more people. And the second location, I believe, was the nursing school at the Quincy Hospital, which had closed. And they offered space, and the same thing, it was housed and uh, overseen by volunteers. But at this point, funds were being sought, and gradually, a few workers were brought on board and Father Bills as a nonprofit organization, or actually it was the Quincy uh, Interfaith Sheltering Coalition at that time, came into being actively. Um, after several months, that building was no longer available and so the churches were canvassed and our church at Wallace and Lutheran 
volunteer to house 20 homeless men every evening. Uh, there was some negotiation that needed to go on with the ladies' aid at the time, as I recall, because the kitchen was going to be used to prepare the meals for the 20 homeless men at our church and about a half dozen homeless women that were at the Quincy Point Congregational Church. The meals were then shipped over there. After that, there was space made available at the St. John's School which was no longer in operation. And after that, this building over here, uh, to your left, my right, uh, became available through the city of Quincy. Uh, the mayor was Mayor Francis McCauley, who coincidentally is being buried today. His funeral is happening as we speak. Uh, took the initiative to make this building available. Prior to that time, Father Bill became very active in working with those across the city that were seeking to end homelessness. And as this building was being prepared, he did some wonders in securing building materials. As we would come out every morning to see the progress, there would be a stack of tiles or something else that had been donated, and so the building was completely refurbished at a very, very low cost from donations from various unions and various companies around the area. <clears throat> After that point, uh, the um, shelter was officially named in Father Bill's honor because he had done so much to bring this building into being as a shelter for homeless people. And that kind of brings us, at least facility-wise, to where we are today. And of course, now we have a wonderful new vision for providing services that will carry us into the future. In the meanwhile, a very ambitious Housing First program took place here at the shelter, and we have many, many off-site locations for people offering them uh, not only housing, but also housing with services. Okay, a few of the people that I remember, and I say this is no comprehensive list. I haven't spoken about donors particularly, but there's people that, that uh, I thought were very in instrumental in bringing services to the homeless. Father Harry, of course, who summoned the first meeting at the Quinty Quincy Interfaith Sheltering was a guiding force at the very beginning. Sister Miriam Patrice, also a passionate advocate and friend of the homeless for many years. She served on our board for many years and was a, a, a wonderful presence among us. Nancy Powers, who was the first director at Father Bill's, had come from the Salvation Army and was actually in a, at the ground meeting uh, from the very beginning. Uh, she was also a very wonderful and efficient person and representative for the agency in the community. And uh, she was the first executive director. Uh, the Reverend Roger Kvam, who was at the Presbyterian pastor, was an early president of the Sheltering Coalition Board, and he was a tireless and very articulate spokesperson on behalf of the homeless. And of course, Father Bill McCarthy, who really needs no introduction, the namesake for our agency, preeminent leader, spokesman, and also a fundraiser uh, that uh, was doing miracles from time to time. Sheila McIntyre, for whom the first Veterans House is named, was a, a, a very ambitious and wonderful and warm person speaking and giving and acting on behalf of the homeless. Joe Flynn, our director who followed Nancy Powers, uh, who could not be with us today, but uh, continues in the work of providing uh, homes for the homeless. 
uh, he actually grew the agency from a startup into a functioning agency that, so that we could go forward. Laurie Boisvert, she was the food coordinator, both when it, the shelter was at our church and when the shelter finally moved here. She could perform miracles in the kitchen. Uh, if there wouldn't be enough something or other, she'd say, that's no problem, I'll just do this. And, uh, faced every crisis that came with a smile and an unflappable attitude. And after her, she, uh, she also organized the Meal a Month program in the early 1990s, and that program is still going, and uh, our church and we are still participating in it, as are many of you, perhaps. Uh, and Paul Anderson, who took care of the kitchen for many years, was also a, a wonderful, wonderful person who who served the meals with a smile. And there were also numerous wonderful volunteers along the way and members of the board who have served in wonderful capacities. I, I think of Jim Wells who organized the Food Fest for so many years. Uh, and the list could go on and on, but I'm not going to. But last and most important, of course, is our present executive director, John Yaswinski. John has been a guiding force for the agency that has kept us abreast of developments of what's happening in the field of providing services for the homeless. And we have been out there ahead of the crowd ever since John came aboard. John started as a housing director here and then later uh, was elevated to this executive director and has brought about a consolidation of services with the shelter in Brockton, Mainspring Shelter and all of their services. And so our agency has grown to be the largest provider of services to the homeless in Southeast Massachusetts. And John continues to do amazing work with this project that you have before you. So at this point, I'm going to introduce John and uh, I hope you will receive him with applause. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Um, you know, Pastor and I have a long history together as, of course, he's a found, one of our founders. And um, he also uh, became the board chair in 1999 when I became the executive director at the time. Um, and I was just a few years out of school then. And uh, it was, you know, amazing to learn from Pastor and Father Bill, especially the first few years here in Quincy, um, just in a sense of having such an even-tempered leader in this community. You know, one of the first things, and I know the staff have heard this probably a few times through the years, one of the things that Pastor and I did together uh, in 2001 is say, let's commit to a strategic plan to end homelessness. And so for me, with more of a business background, one night, Pastor and I stood outside in line with all the guests. And before our, our meeting with the board on the strategic plan, we asked all the guests that night, 140 people came in that night. Um, we asked them one question, how can Father Bills in Mainspring help you? We took their answers, we wrote them on post-it notes, and we put them up in front of the board of directors. 80% of the answers, 80% the of the responses was one word, the same word. I need a home. And really, that board meeting, that first strategic plan is when Father Bills in Mainspring said, we will continue to let everybody indoors every night and have a compassionate response at the emergency shelters. But during the day and during the night and around the clock, we will really fight for housing. And we will not just advocate for it, we won't just try to support it with our partners, we will start doing it ourselves if we have to. 
And so with that, I want to just th thank Pastor for all of his years of support, not just for the greater homeless community here, but Pastor was one of the first ones that created a lot of elderly, affordable housing in the city of Quincy. Thank you, Pastor. You know, Mayor Koch, um, as Pastor said, Mayor Koch couldn't be here and all the other city officials and state officials because they're attending Mayor McCauley's services. And, um, you know, I was honored a few years ago to be get the Frank McCauley Person of the Year Award uh, through the Lions Club. And it was amazing that day when I talked to Frank and the stories that he told about how Father Bill was on him 24 seven to get this building in 1988. Um, if people, you know, um, never met Father Bill, when, when he had an idea uh, and he knew he wanted something, he never quit or gave up. And he had a tremendous style uh, about him. You know, my first day as executive director, Father Bill had me drive his car up to meet the mayor. He's like, I'm gonna introduce you to the mayor, John, because you're the new director of Father Bill's. And Father Bill parked in the mayor's parking spot. <laughs> and that's where I was like, wow, this is gonna be really fun. <laughs> you know, um, it, a project like this can't happen without public support. Of course, as you guys know, you know, with Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito and DHCD, we had this, they all came out in the, in the uh, spring and did a, a, a press release here, a press conference here to talk about this project. And, you know, several years ago, the mayor came to us and said he's gonna be building a new police headquarters and that was gonna greatly affect Father Bill's shelter here. And at that time, we had already had a strategic plan to know that we've got a backdoor strategy. We've been committed to housing, getting people out of the shelter, but we were coming with a front door strategy. And that meant that we were gonna change the way we manage homelessness and say it's time to try a new delivery model. It's time to do things differently to address homelessness. And when we presented that to the mayor and to the city leaders, it became a great partnership to make us be a part of the development. You know, with that, I can't say enough of the city's Department of Planning and Community Development. I know Sean Glennon is here. The Quincy Affordable Housing Trust Committee committed a million dollars to this project very early on. The Quincy Housing Authority providing subsidies that will go into the housing units. And we want to thank, of course, the Quincy City Council, which along with the mayor, approved a 99-year lease across the street here at 39 Broad Street. They all made sure that we were part of the city's plans for the new public safety headquarters. Several councilors in particular have been champions for our mission and the people we serve. One of them is Brian Palmucci. He is also a member of the Quincy Affordable Housing Trust Committee. Councilor Pamucci has been in regular communication with our team to let us learn from our staff and the people who rely on our services to make sure that it's a priority for the council. Councilor Palmucci has really believed in our mission and he helped fight to make sure this project would continue for people struggling with homelessness in our community. We're grateful to him and all the city council for all of their support and the whole Quincy community. So we're very excited to have Brian here today to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day we have in Quincy to celebrate this uh, very special occasion. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, many of my colleagues uh, are unable to join us this morning because they're uh, mourning the passing of former Mayor McCauley. 
Uh, so it's, it's my delight to be able to bring the greetings of the city on behalf of the mayor and the city council. Uh, this is a project that we all support, obviously, um, very deeply, um, and we're, we're very excited that it's moving forward. Thank you, uh, John, for your very kind words. Uh, Reverend Wismar, thank you. Uh, welcome supporters, right? Friends of Father Bill's. Uh, it's the folks who are in this room who made this possible. It's also the folks who were here before us. Uh, I've had the pleasure of serving on the Quincy City Council for the past 12 years, but it's the colleagues in government who came before us who allowed us to build upon what they created to get to the place we are today. I, I know there's my um, former council colleague, Kevin McCoughlin, uh, Kevin Coughlin, is here with us today. Um, he was one of those leaders who fought on this issue for, for decades. So we come together this morning uh, in celebration of not just a new building, but a new idea, a different approach to ending homelessness in our area. One that not only seeks to shelter people, but even more to provide them with, with a level of health care, support service, services and programming that is desperately needed. Uh, I, I'm the father of two very uh, young children, um, and I was thinking the other day they, they break a lot of things. I was thinking uh, groundbreaking is the only time we actually celebrate breaking something, right? <laughs> um, and and a groundbreaking is such a great word for what we're doing here today uh, because it's just so appropriate because it's a, the term for what we're doing here today, groundbreaking, not only will shovels hit the dirt, but we're also breaking ground in the programs that'll be offered, in the model that's being delivered. It's groundbreaking in that sense as well. Combating homelessness in the way that John and his team envision is groundbreaking. And as many of you know, the, the new facility uh, will have almost half as many emergency shelter beds. And you think of that, we're building a new facility and it has almost half as many emergency shelter beds. That's a new approach to reduce the amount of emergency beds by reducing the need for those emergency beds. To rehouse people permanently and assist them out of the cycle of homelessness. That's the vision for this project. And the future success of this project won't be measured in how many people it shelters but how many people it no longer needs to shelter, because that is the goal here today and the goal of Father Bill's in Mainspring. Having a safe and secure place to live is right up there with the, the fundamental needs of oxygen, food, and water. And without ho housing, folks cannot excel or advance in life. They can't move forward with, with stable employment or or seek educational opportunities, it begins with housing. And it all starts here in helping people get back on their feet. Father Bill's and Mainspring's motto is nobody should be homeless. It's right there on your, your programs. It's simple, it's succinct, and yet it's such a lofty and difficult goal. This groundbreaking today represents a giant step forward in realizing that goal in our community and in our region. It's an honor to, for me to be here at this pivotal occasion, and I look forward to the amazing things that will come from Father Bill's in Main Spring in the years to come from this facility. As we all know, John and his, and his team do an amazing job here, uh, and I trust when we give them, uh, I trust with these additional resources we're giving them, they'll continue to, to excel uh, in, that, in the performance of their tasks. We're very lucky to have John and his team uh, in our community, and I say that as a, as a leader in Quincy. Um, we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're staying here. And we're glad that there won't be a disruption in your services that you're providing to the community. Uh, it's really a testament to, to John and his team that they saw this moment as an opportunity instead of an obstacle. They took what could have been a very difficult and perhaps was a very difficult situation, uh, and they came up with not just a rebuild, not just a replication of service, but a reimagined facility in a new model to combat homelessness. 
So I thank you, John, and I thank everyone involved for your service to the city of Quincy and to the community. And then lastly, perhaps I probably should have started with this, uh, I want to thank everybody who has um, played a role in getting us to this point today, the, especially the folks who have financially supported this project. Uh, this couldn't be done without all of your support. I am not going to start naming names because I will in, uh, undoubtedly offend someone by forgetting them. Um, but I think there's a, there's a nice list over there you can read. Um, but this wouldn't be happening today if it wasn't for all of these partners coming together with a shared vision from the city, uh, the Mayor Koch's administration, the uh, Governor Baker and Polito administration, uh, John and his team, and the many individual corporate and philanthropy uh, donations that have come in uh, to support this project. So I thank all of you for being here today, and, uh, and I wish John and his team the best. We know they'll do an incredible job in the new facility. So thank you. You know, when we were going through this project, um, I, th I think the mayor got tired of meeting with me <laughs> all the time on this project. And so um, this, this, was, this didn't happen overnight. And, and as uh, you know, Brian has said, uh, a lot of difficult conversations through the years and situations to make this project where we are today. But the mayor picked Kevin Coughlin to be the liaison for this project for the city of Quincy. And Kevin, for the past few years, has been working nonstop to make sure that all the collaborators, all the partners on the public and private side of Father Bills and Mainspring in the city, just make sure that this project got done. Uh, Kevin and I used to talk on weekends and weeknights and a lot of strategy sessions, and I just want to personally thank him for his commitment. We wouldn't be here without you. <laughs> the groundbreaking today is about one project and two elements needed. A new facility that won't just manage homelessness, but will prevent it and end it quickly. The other element, the other building, will provide 30 units of permanent supportive housing that is affordable to people in need of a home. We committed in early 2000s to really start ending homelessness on the housing side, as I've said, housing first. And now, as I said before, we've got a new model to bring to Quincy and look to bring to the city of Brockton hopefully soon also. June 2nd, 2008. June 2nd, 2008. Turns out this was a great day for Father Bills in Mainspring because this is the day that Father Bills in Mainspring hired April Conley as an employee of Father Bill's in Mainspring. April has had many roles in our organization for the past 13 years. But it didn't take long for her to become a leader here at Father Bill's. And April, as our COO, in connection with Liz Rogers, who's here today from our team, is one of the main architects of this new and bold service delivery model. We've asked April today to speak about this new model. What will happen in the building behind us today in the new HRC? So please join me in welcoming April Conley. Thanks, John. Hi. I'm always nervous when John speaks because I worry I'm going to start crying out of joy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I really was nervous then because I'm about to speak to all of you. So I'm um, glad that he didn't make me cry. Thank you, John, for that. Um, 
And thank you, Pastor, for um, providing us with a sort of historical view of where, how we've gotten here today. As, the past, as Pastor Wismar shared with us, emergency shelters started in response to a crisis. They started to meet an immediate need and just get people off the street to help them survive, to make sure that people didn't pass away. What they became was a de facto safety net. Emergency shelters, which were intended to be short term, get people in, off the streets, and then return them to, to homes, became the safety net for residential programs, treatment programs, really where people who were so vulnerable and struggling with so many, so many issues couldn't be successful. But they remained under-resourced, they became overcrowded, and we were all here trying to manage. And many of you supported us and have supported us for years to fill the gaps, to just allow us to meet basic needs, to provide the bed and the meal and the shower, which are all incredibly important, as Councillor Palmucci shared. That's what we all need, just to start. But we always knew, Father Bills in Main Spring knew, from the time it was the Quincy Interfaith Sheltering Coalition to now it, it being Father Bills in Main Spring, we knew we could do better for our most vulnerable neighbors. We knew we could do something that would really positively impact them and the community in the long term. We can still address the crisis. We can still respond to the emergency need that night, but we can do it in a more humane, supportive, and efficient way than what we're doing right now. We can front load assessment, support, and assistance as soon as someone identifies that they're in a crisis. We've been talking about this I mean, John, I, in 2008, I joined the organization, and within a few years, we were talking about a triage model. Many of the board members will remember us talking about triage. Many of the staff have been hearing about this for years. And we've never had the resources to do it. We've tried, we've plugged, we've sort of patched things together, but we've never had the resources to really do it, to really make the investment. The menu of services that'll happen in this building pictured here will include prevention for those who haven't quite hit our doors, to get to people before they have to leave their homes, diversion for people who are, are coming to the door, but maybe we can figure something out temporarily while we get them back into homes. And of course, rehousing in an emergency bed for the people who we can't simply prevent from coming into the doors. We'll still meet that need, but we'll rapidly rehouse them as quickly as possible, and we'll have the resources to do it. The HRC, the Housing Resource Continuum, and the Housing Resource Center will be robust. It will have co-located substance use services, mental health services, a full medical primary care facility, and will be welcoming to anyone at any time of day. So right now our emergency shelter has to, people have to wait to get in till four in the afternoon. They line up and then they have to leave in the morning because we simply don't have the resources to accommodate them during the day. The HRC will be a day center. It will be busy and buzzing all day with services and resources, delivering them to the people who need them most. We had our architect team present the renderings to our staff. Um, now it was probably two years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, and it will be, as David Flaschenreim described, a beacon, literally with a light shining out of the building to market for those most vulnerable and in, in need of our services. There isn't one thing 
that the Housing Resource Center will offer that's necessarily new. Prevention, diversion, rapid rehousing, permanent supported housing, these are all well-established, evidence-based best practices. We know that. What's new, what's innovative, what is pioneering in the field of homelessness is that we're gonna put it in one place. We'll streamline access to it. We'll make sure that we can deliver the resource to the person in need as quickly as possible with as few barriers as possible. That is true innovation, oddly enough. We've known, we have known, and I look at the staff who always sit, stand in the back of the tents in these events, but the staff have known how to respond. They know what people need, but we've just never been able to give it to them. And I look around this room and, and I look at all the private support and public support that again over the past years, at least for my time here, has filled a gap for basic needs. And for the first time, we can look at the Arbella Foundation, the Yaki Foundation, and many, many others, and say to you, we are excited to partner on this new initiative. We're excited to accept your support and meet more than basic needs, to give people a place to live and not survive. We're thrilled to be able to do that with you. And we really appreciate the partnership. We appreciate the partnership to fill the gap and we appreciate the partnership to build something with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, April. People say I have a lot of passion, but I think April rivals the passion here. You know, April talked about what, you know, the partnerships and what will go on in this building, and, and I just want to call out, you know, some of these partners are here today that will be in this building. You know, Doris Cox from Bay State is here, and they'll be helping us with substance abuse issues there. Cynthia from Manit Health. Cynthia and Manit Health have done amazing work, amazing work with Healthcare for the Homeless here at Father Bill's during this pandemic. It's been a, it, unbelievable. The testing, the vaccine access for, for the people in our community has been unbelievable. We'll, we'll provide the medical site here. Um, and Rick Doan, Interface Social Services. Um, you know, Rick's program makes sure that people here, if they, if they need food and they move into the community, if they need clothing, if someone's gonna get a job interview, we make sure that we connect there. So those are the resources. And, and the greatest thing about the South Shore is, is we work really well together. <laughs> I'm not sure every community and region can say that, but we work really well together. And it really is people putting their egos at the door and saying, how do we join forces? You know, as we know, um, it, it takes a lot for, to build and to support a building um, that's gonna be around, two buildings gonna be about $24 million. And um, really the state, stepped up early on and committed to this model and to this project. Um, CDAC um, has, once again, was supporting this project with pre-development money, uh, with funding as when it was just an idea. Um, I remember going to Roger Herzog's office at CDAC during the last recession. Um, we were talking about stimulus money that was coming and I'm like, Roger, I've got an idea in Quincy um, years ago about how to support this. Um, Roger and CDAC and DHCD uh, understand to, that we have to end homelessness. We need to invest in housing. But the HRC model to a lot of policymakers is very scary because it's new and it's bold. But I want to thank Roger and CDAC and DHCD for believing in us and their tremendous support for this project. So please join me in welcoming Roger Herzog from CDAC today.
Well, like April, I didn't know where John was going with that. And of course, when we talk about meeting when the stimulus funds were flowing after the recession of 2009 to 2010, of course, the logical next question is, what took so long? <laughs> um, great things are worth waiting for. Uh, I've got a dilemma here. First of all, I'm following some incredible and very inspiring speakers. Um, and I don't think I'm gonna be able to rise to the level of inspiration, but um, I will carry on nonetheless. I've got a real dilemma. Because on one side, I look at this project and process and it's so complicated. CDAC itself, one of the funding partners, we play multiple roles. We, we provided, as John said, early stage pre-development funding to try and help Father Bills and Mainstream plan the project and move it along. And then we also work very closely with the state's Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD, to manage some of the bond funds. So these are very different financing roles. And then the project itself, it's these two phases, the emergency shelter and services and the permanent support of housing. And that's complicated. And, um, and then I'm here representing both CDAC and DHCD. My colleagues at DHCD couldn't make it today, so I certainly want to um, represent them well. Um, all those complications. And then, and then I'm faced with Father Bills and Mainstream and their incredible staff and board and development team. I mean, this is an all-star cast. Um, and every time we come out to see this site, it evidently is sunny and 65. <laughs> and all those complications kind of melt away. Um, and it becomes so clear. And because of John and April and Liz's commitment and clear-headed strategy and passion, it makes it very easy for us funders to look at this concept and say, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. How can we help? So I certainly want to congratulate Father Bills and Mainspring and its partners for bringing the project to this important milestone. And Councillor Palmucci, I love your, your riff on groundbreakings. Um, I share it, I, I love them. It's always nice to come and see the beautiful new building that's built and we can't wait for that. And to start seeing folks getting served and housed in this new facility. But so much work has already gone on to reach this point in the process that we do need to take a pause, um, a deep sigh and say, we've done great work, let's celebrate that and now let's get this built. As you've heard explained very well, this is a project that is meeting the moment as we hopefully are moving out of this COVID epidemic that we've been struggling with and accompanied economic recession, we need new ways of addressing our scourge of homelessness. And this project is clearly gonna show us a path forward, um, how to meet the emergency needs and the long-term housing needs through permanent supportive housing. Thank you for showing us how this model can work. I need to give a lot of credit to my colleagues at the Department of Housing and Community Development who couldn't be there, headed by Undersecretary Jennifer Maddox and uh, Kate Racer, who heads up their housing development team. Um, the amount of resources that DHCD has committed to both phases of this project is impressive. Um, the, the, um, as, as John mentioned, we were out here last spring with the governor and the lieutenant governor and many state and local officials to hear the announcement that the first phase of the project had 
received its funding. It was funded in a very innovative process, um, a competitive funding round that the state has set up just to produce supportive housing across the state. And um, the, uh, the governor chose this site to come and announce funding for a series of projects that had all competed and successfully received awards. Um, we're now in the ninth annual funding round of these dedicated supportive housing rounds. And the concept is a winning concept. It allows these projects to move forward more quickly than if they were um, competing in what we consider normal funding rounds with every flavor of affordable housing. Um, and to start to improve the coordination of the different kinds of money that need to be pulled together for a successful supportive housing project. The capital dollars to build it, the operating dollars to manage and run it, and the service dollars to deliver the needed services to residents. Um, uh, we still have work to do to improve the coordination of that system, but these coordinated funding rounds is a real step forward and um, we're so pleased that projects like this can, um, can get funded in that mechanism. Um, and then Father's Bill's got the rest of the funding through uh, a different funding cycle that was uh, just announced over the summer. And the bottom line is this is all ready to move forward, which is a great thing. I want to also uh, thank all of our funding partners from other public and private agencies. And as a point of personal privilege, I want to give a special shout out to my dear colleague, Rick Morita at Rockland Bank and Trust. Um, not only is Rick a premier banker and Rockland is very involved in this project as a permanent lender, um, but Rick has also served um, for several years as CDAC's board treasurer and much appreciated. Um, so I want to um, also give a shout out to my colleague from CDAC, Will Morgan, who's been our project manager on this. Um, we are just thrilled to be partners on this project and so many other projects with Father Bills. You are keeping us very busy, but in a great way. So congratulations, thank you, and we look forward to watching the progress. Thanks, Roger. We definitely have some more projects lined up, so we'll, we'll be calling. Um, as Roger mentioned, you know, the other lenders in the project, you know, want to thank Excited with Rockland Trust and, and also Property Casualty Initiative, Paula Zakin is here. They were early on one of the pre-development funders and have been with us in the Brockton, Quincy community for years. So thank you for believing in this model also. You know, we wouldn't be here today without support from corporate partners and leading the way has been John Donahue, president and CEO of Arbella Insurance Group, and a member of the Housing Resource Campaign Leadership Cabinet. You know, we have to raise about $10 million privately of the $24 uh, million for this project, um, not just to build the buildings, but as April said, to give the team the resources needed for the interventions to end homelessness. Um, it's amazing and it's fitting that the first major gift for this project came from Arbella, which of course is based in Quincy. For over 15 years, the Arbella Insurance Group and its foundation have supported our mission. They have been a leading annual sponsor for our annual fundraiser, the Food Fest. Arbella employees are regularly volunteers in our shelter kitchens, preparing and serving meals to the guests. They stepped up very early during the COVID pandemic to offer much needed support. And most recently, the foundation committed $600,000 in support of the Housing Resource Center in Quincy and I don't know if people know, but we bought, we bought a hotel in Brockton and we're converting it 
to permanent housing. And the Arbella Foundation committed $300,000 to that project and $300,000 to this project. Thank you to Liz Kim, member of our board of directors and Arbella's board of directors recently. Um, and to Beverly Tangvik, president of the Arbella Insurance Foundation for all of your support. You know, John and I were laughing earlier that um, when we first brought this project up to the board, it was at Arbella where we have our board meetings. And, um, and people are like, wow, John, you are crazy thinking this is gonna work. And I think John and I laughed and said, well, we're both kind of crazy, right? So my pleasure to introduce John Donahue, the CEO and president of Arbella Insurance. Thank you, John. Uh, I have to say that uh, we need a lot more crazies like you to, to help things get better in this world. So on behalf of the campaign cabinet, I want to thank all of you that are here and, and many others that aren't here for the incredible generosity of people, both individuals and corporations and foundations that have stepped up to make this possible uh, in addition to the state funding. And especially uh, the folks from the Yawkey Foundation who have really stepped up in a big, big way. So very proud to be here today. Uh, not gonna try and repeat what everybody said, but I do wanna just touch on, on two important things as we celebrate today. The first one everybody knows, that housing insecurity unfortunately continues to be an urgent crisis, not only in our city, our state, but our country. Uh, and it is so sad that for so long, the primary response was what I would call crisis management. Just putting a Band-Aid on the problem, while it was a critical response, it did not go towards solving the problem. Uh, and that continues to be true today. Secondly, I think it's important to acknowledge and understand that it is both wonderful and somewhat sad that we are referring to the HRC as revolutionary. Uh, it is wonderful because they are doing something that is going to be a very critical model across our country about how to permanently end homelessness. But it's sad that it has taken this long to get something like this created. But at the end of the day, we are moving forward in a very new and a very wonderful way, and we are so proud at Arbella to be part of it and look forward to continue to support all of you. Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, the Yawkey Foundation has supported Father Bills in Mainspring since 2004. Since its founding in 1977, the Yawkey Foundation has donated to hundreds of nonprofits serving those in need in Massachusetts. Over the last 20 years alone, the Yawkey Foundation has granted more than $300 million to charities throughout greater Boston with a consistent focus to the underserved communities and marginalized populations. Projects of this magnitude can't be built without lead gifts. You know, in, I don't know if Maureen will remember this meeting, because um, I kept bothering her since 2004, but um, when it comes to this project, I went in and met with Maureen and her team in 2011 and brought this idea up to her. And they gave us funding to discuss, we discussed the triage and assessment model and she gave us funding for it. Then in 2014, I came back and actually had a rendition of the building. And we presented the HRC model to Maureen and the Yaki Foundation. You know, over the last year, we've been working with Maureen and Alicia Verity on this project. 10 years we've been doing it together where the Yaki Foundation has been giving us dollars every year to help with the conversion. We couldn't start at ground zero here and expect to do this model. Our team has been converting our way we deliver services for a long time. In September, we were notified that we were receiving a transformational gift of $2 million from
from the Yaki Foundation, which is among the largest private donations we've ever received. In honor of that generous gift, and in recognition of all the years of Yaki Foundation's support of our mission, we were excited to say that the Housing Resource Center would be named the Yaki Housing Resource Center. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, trustees, for your confidence and belief in all your support through the years. With that, I'd like to ask Maureen Blade, CEO of the Yaki Foundation, to come up. Great. Thank you so much, John. And thanks to all of you, the public officials and board members and staff of Father Bills that have made today possible. As John said, I'm joined by Alicia Verity and also John Redman and Karen Green and Ann Fortune. We do do a lot of work in human service in the Yaki's name and on behalf of the trustees and that's the team that gets it done every day. We're delighted to be here in Quincy for this groundbreaking. The sense of community and public-private collaboration that this project represents is truly inspiring. And yes, John used to come in and he'd say, okay, here's where we're at. And you know, and it was kind of moving pieces, but you stayed with it and that's why we're all here today. On behalf of the trustees and staff of the Yaki Foundation, I'd like to express our congratulations to Father Bills and Mainspring for having the vision and the persistence to get to this moment. As John said, we've been a longtime supporter of Father Bills in Mainspring, both here in Quincy and in Brockton. I had the wonderful good fortune to know Father Bill McCarthy. I met him in 1991 when we both served on the board of another charity that provides housing for the working poor. And like the Yaquis, Father Bill was practical and quietly determined to ensure that the most vulnerable among us received the care and dignity they deserved. And I do remember when Father Bill introduced me to the newly hired John Yaswinski. Father Bill had great confidence in John and it's proven to be well placed. At Yaki Foundation, we seek to fund projects and programs that align with our stated priorities. And those priorities are the things that Tom and Jean Yaki cared about during their lifetime. Again, quiet philanthropy and food and shelters at the heart of those priorities. But for an investment of this size, the Yaki Foundation also looks for a nonprofit with leadership excellence, and there could be no better example of that than John Yaswinski and the Board of Father Bills. We'd like to thank Katie Riley, who helped shepherd this project and relationship through with us. She made our work back at the Foundation very easy. And we'd also like to applaud the Narrowgate Architecture Team for their amazing work designing a building that embodies the dignity, sustainability, and beauty of the guests the Yaki Housing Resource Center is going to serve. This center is a much needed resource for the South Shore community and the programs that are going to happen in this building will serve as a model for others to end and prevent homelessness. We truly look forward to following the progress of this important project and can't wait to come back for the ribbon cutting. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Maureen. This has been a great friendship for a long time. We're finally there. You know, I want to take a minute and recognize also the private supporters that are in attendance um, that have really stepped up in helping us raise the $10 million. I'd like to recognize Eastern Bank. Nancy Steger is here from the foundation. Uh, Rockland Trust, Blue Hills Charitable Foundation. Of course, we've talked about uh, Rick Moradas here. Uh, Andrea Borwicki and Bob Giamarco are also here. Uh, South Shore Bank, Jim Dumphy, Jane Bowman, and Steve Dupree. Um, and also, you know, somebody that's on our leadership cabinet that is a big angel for us in this greater South Shore community. Um, and her parents were the founders of Mainspring um, from Jack Conway and Company. Carol Bowman is also here in the audience with Al Becker. Um, you know, I want to also say that uh, we have just received tremendous news that um, a couple of weeks ago we hosted uh, Alan 
McKim, Bill McKim and their family. And um, they have also now committed to a lead gift for this project. Thank you, Alan and Bill, for that tremendous support. You know, as Roger said, we have an all-star development team. So I, wa I want to thank NeighborWorks Housing Solutions as our owner's rep. The architects have been mentioned, Narrowgate. Um, Del Brook, Jake Cass is our um, general contractor. Mike Fish is here. Um, and our project attorneys, and everybody knows when you do housing development, you better have really good attorneys. Uh, Hackett Feinberg and uh, Anthony Matera. You know, I also want to, um, and, and I know uh, Maureen mentioned her, but $10 million, we've never raised that at Father Bill's in Mainspring in private donations. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without our development team and our leader of that development team, uh, Katie Riley. Thank you, Katie. You know, there's, uh, our, many members of our staff are here, and of course, we're 24-7, so not everybody can come. But, uh, you know, our staff during the COVID pandemic never paused, always came to work, always put their life on the line when everybody was getting infected. Our staff have been able to provide a compassionate response to homelessness serving people, getting people in through all the years. But they've also been committed to innovation, strategic planning, research, data-driven. I know they get, you know, you know, why do I have to fill out all of this stuff? Because when we get the data, when we get the research, we can give it to the community. And together we can see when we educate people about how to end homelessness. You need the information. We've got a tremendous staff. Please thank Join me in thanking our staff at Father Bill's and Mary's Club. You know, um, we'll be wrapping up in a minute, and please, on your cards, we're going to come over. And, you know, one of the big things was to give everybody a hard hat today. Um, is, you know, please look on the card as we'd like to, you know, have all of our speakers, all of our donors and the staff uh, will get organized, our team, to, to take um, shovel groundbreaking photos. So please join us when we're done. At the end, just thank you, all of you, for helping us get here. We've had a plan. It's been built on compassion, but it's also been built on best practices, as April said, and data, and our own experience of over 30 years. Our belief is in our progressive engagement model that will meet people where they're at because we believe nobody should be homeless. We will be closing today with a blessing from Reverend Rebecca Froome, minister at the United First Parish Church in Quincy. Reverend Froome is a member of the Quincy Interfaith Network, which has been a tireless advocate for our mission. Joined also during the years with Pastor Alyssa Olison from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. On behalf of the Quincy Interfaith Network, regularly reaches out to us to see what our team needs and what our guests need. In February 2020, the Quincy Interfaith Network wrote a letter of support for our Housing Resource Center vision signed by nearly 40 interfaith leaders. That letter, thank you, was sent to every elected leader. I know, Brian, you probably got it. And also sent to the Quincy Sun, saying this is the right thing to do in our community. Also back in November 2019, Reverend Froome, led a special memorial service at the United First Parish to honor 20 former guests of Father Bill's place who had recently passed away. It sent such a powerful message there in one of the most prominent buildings in this city, 
the Church of the Presidents, where two presidents and their wives are entombed, that we were able to honor our guests. The people we serve matter, and their lives are worth remembering and honoring. Thank you, Rebecca, for hosting us. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for being today. Please come up. I'd love to have you. Close your prayer. What an introduction. I now join April in this feeling of... <laughs> I'm here as part of Quincy Interfaith Network, a group that came together to gather and lift up the voice and witness of people of faith and conviction in the public sphere to promote justice, inclusion, and interfaith community action. So let me first invite folks to take a deep breath and let it out feeling that spirit of life and love that moves within, between, and beyond us all, connecting us generation to generation, past, present, and future. Will you lift your hearts and join me in the spirit of prayer, listening in these words for the language of faith most meaningful to you? Eternal presence, known in many ways, known in by many names, Gracious God who meets us in acts of love and mercy and courage, may we remember with overflowing gratitude the spirit of hope and possibility that is present this beautiful day. May this spirit stay with us through the months of construction and the years in which this resource center will stand. May this resource center be blessed with peace so that all who enter these doors might know safety and security. May this resource center be blessed with love and kindness so that all who enter these doors might remember their own inherent worth and dignity. So that all might remember that each of us are worthy of love and each of us are able to love. May this house be blessed with compassion and hope so that all that enter these doors might know that their life journey matters, so that all who enter these doors might be strengthened and encouraged as they continue on their journey towards home. May this resource center be blessed with the generosity and the commitment of our hearts and our hands so that this building might serve as a living witness, as a beacon to the humanitarian truth that nobody should be homeless. We pray this for love's sake. Amen. And blessed be. Thank you, Reverend. In closing, you know, uh, Father Bill's in Mainspring can't do projects like this without a tremendous board of directors. They've been so supportive of this long-term project, believed in the mission every day, making sure everybody has a safe place to stay, but being aggressive and strategic and wanting to end homelessness. So I just wanna thank our board of directors for believing in this model. And I'd like to thank the people in attendance today, Mike Krasanek, our board chair, Dave Arnold, Al Becker, Liz Kim, Jim Oslin, and of course, Pastor Wismar. Thank you everybody for coming today and thank you for helping us get here today. God bless.